good day everyone, or make it actually a good evening, I guess. So, welcome to another of my live streams, and today we will talk about hardware challenges. It won't be actual hardware, but it will be close enough for me to actually say these are hardware challenges. It will actually be hardware des description language challenges, as an FPGA-based challenges, where in... Well, kinda, again, kinda. Um, I guess I will get to the details later, but expect Verilog. That's basically the gist of it. And now... Um, what will I... Oh, wait. I need to start my panel with questions. Otherwise, I would not be able to answer your questions. And speaking of questions, today's moderator is Kshaku. And if you have any questions during the live stream, as usual, you have to actually ping this person. Yeah, like you see Kshaku's nickname here, you have to ping with him and um, on IRC or Discord or YouTube chat, doesn't matter where you are, you have to actually say Kshaku and then the question. This way he will be able to take the question, put it in the panel and I will be able to read it. I sometimes look at the chats, I have them open my separate monitor, but uh, you know, I'm usually focused on what I do, therefore it's easier if you just ping Shaku and tell him the question. Uh, that being said, if you are on our IRC, or I think Discord as well, you can try do exclamation mark Q and then the question, and that will get to our panel as well. So, that's it. Now, before we start, I'm going to go with a couple of updates as usual, um, no surprises there. And, mm, yeah, and then we'll start with... Uh, with the tasks. Cool. Let's move here and I'm pretty sure I had... Yes. This is Kshaku's website. So again, thank you to my moderator today, Kshaku, for being here. Also, thank you for uh, Foxtrot Charlie, who I saw somewhere around where he might jump in to the channel as well. So, yeah. And if you're interested, you can subscribe to Kshaku's website. I'm pretty sure there's an error the RSS channel as well, and the Twitter, for example. Then, uh, yeah, speaking of various random things, Paged Out is about to be finalized. If you're, I guess I'm talking about Paged Out almost every week. Paged Out is a new magazine I'm doing with a couple of folks, Kshaku, for example, with Ural, with uh, Foxtrot Charlie, with Disconnected, with Kala, and um, yeah, also for Ashi. And the design will be kind of experimental. Each article will be only one page, so you have to squeeze a lot of information into one page because you will not get more pages, just one page. It's actually quite cool to read articles which, you know, like go to the gist, like really short intro and then the gist of the article. Uh, just one page, fast to read, fast to write, and fast to review. And we are, uh, we, I don't believe we'll reach the 50 required articles, which I wanted for the first issue, but we are already at 40 articles, and I know a couple of more are on the way, so we will probably have around 45 articles. Uh, the time to send in articles, if you still want to publish an article in the first issue of the Paged Out magazine, you have to submit them in like next week, maybe next 10 days, because around uh, the 30th of July uh, we will basically do a cutoff and uh, we will start finalizing the issue, putting it in one PDF and making it available for free to download. I foresee that the first issue will be first published as like a release candidate beta version, not like the final version, because this is the first time we are actually putting a lot of different PDFs into one PDF and I expect a lot of things to fail. So yeah, there you have it. If you're interested interested in actually writing an article, uh, then go to Paged Out Institute. Um, and yeah, it's actually like also scrolling somewhere like in my in my feed. Wait, yeah, there in, in the feed. I have a link from time to time if you missed it. And there's this like call for pages or writing article sections which call for pages describes the process. There is also like some example articles what we are talking about. For example, like this is an article by Kutschuk uh, about some hardware stuff. This is uh, my article with a game written on one page. And, uh, and then there's another article. We, we should publish one more example really soon. Actually, it has been published already in the Polish Programista magazine as an ad. Uh, but I guess I have to publish it here as well. 
yeah, that being said, um, yeah, after that, we will just like, you will be able to download it. If you will like to print it to give it away for free, you will like, also be able to do that. So uh, I'm really looking forward to like when we actually have the first issue pushed out and or pitched out. Then today's topic, as I mentioned, is going to be two harder tasks, right? Uh, one task will be about the flag ROM challenge from Google CTF qualification round. If you go to capture the flag dot with Google dot com or uh, you can just go to g dot slash CTF. It also leads there uh, just a short link, pretty convenient actually. And challenges, you will find it in the hardware section. Yes, there is a hardware section in Google qualification round. And it's a flag room. It was solved a lot of times, actually. Um, it got really good feedback from folks. And um, yeah, so this will be the first task we are going to solve today. Full disclosure, this is a task I made with Garrett. So the very log code there is Garrett's. Everything else is mine, basically. Almost everything else. So um, yeah, there's that. 57 solves, first blood went to spam and hex, uh, really good top team. Then the second task is actually a task made by Kutrzyk, who has already mentioned, you know, the example article from page out about hardware. Uh, Kutrzyk made also a task, a CTF task. The task was for, uh, but this is the incorrect page, WCTF 2019. But not this one, this one, I believe. Yeah. Mm. So basically every year now there is a Chinese CTF in, in China, surprise. And uh, it's uh, basically, well, actually there are two CTFs at the same time. There is this WCTF online CTF, which you can find on CTF time. And there is also the WCTF masters CTF, which is an invite only CTF for top teams from the CTF time ranking. And our team got invited uh, again this year. Yeah, this is this Masters WCTF. And yeah, as you can see, Dragon Sector, Poland. And uh, our team actually got second place. And the idea of the, CTF, uh, of the CTF is that every invited team has to make two CTF challenges. And therefore, you know, you have like 10 teams, 20 challenges in total. And you have to, during the CTF, solve the tasks of other teams. And after that, the tasks, by the way, have to be solvable. They have to be uh, pretty decent, actually. And um, after that, the tasks are being also evaluated. And the judges are basically... And I think there is also feedback from the team. I'm not really clear on how that works, but it's, the tasks are evaluated and they are scored. And I think Shellfish got the best uh, task award this year. Anyway, and that's also added to the CTF score. So you first have to solve both the tasks and you have also make uh, decent challenges so they are pretty high ranked uh, to add to your score and yeah and our team got second place uh, this year i think we won like thirty thousand dollars something like that congratulations to everyone who played i actually didn't play so mm, yeah i can just be proud of my team uh, that being said i did test the challenge which was prepared by uh, kutrzyk so i'm familiar with it actually that's why i have um hopes of solving it because in all honesty verlog isn't my thing as in i really like it but i'm still learning it therefore i was quite happy to be able at least to test solve a task uh, like this and it's a pretty cool task that's why i wanted to show it now depending on how if we start running out of time i know that kutschik's task will actually take some time i might push it back to next week we will see how long flag Rome will actually take. If that happens, then I will push it ne to next week. Uh, otherwise, I will try to solve both tasks and show you both tasks today. And the next week we'll be doing, uh, probably making an Arduino based programmer for 8051 chips, because that's something I have like on the breadboard here and I just wanted to show it to you. It's not something I'm an expert on, but it's something I should be able to at least tell you about if you ever wondered how the you know the microcontrollers are being programmed what does the programmer do then this is your chance because i had to uh, become really familiar with that specific protocol and it's actually quite funny and it's in not only arduino there will be some additional chips there too but that's next week or in two weeks depending on 
about. So the challenge was actually uh, Kutschek's challenge, which is called TPM2137, was actually published already open sourced on Twitter. The flag roam challenge isn't open sourced yet, but most challenges will be open sourced from Google CTF soon-ish. So um, yeah, you'll also get the flag roam uh, CTF source code if you would be interested in that. Not today, but in a couple of weeks. Cool. So, are there any questions? If there are any questions, I will answer your questions now and then we'll jump into the topics. So I'm going to take a quick look if there are any questions and if there are, they should appear here. So Daniel says, how would someone go about solving a CTF task where you have no idea what you are looking for whatsoever? That's pretty weird actually. So it's like this, a good CTF task usually has, it's constructed in a way that you know exactly what you have to do, but it's technically hard and challenging to do it. So if you approach a task and you don't know it, well, you usually know the category, right? The category will be like crypto reversing or sandbox, pawn or whatever, right? If you don't know even that, then uh, yeah, then you just hope there is something in the description. Maybe the task is self-obvious. If not, then it, there is a lot of head scratching involved and it not, doesn't always end up well. So a lot of it depends on the category because actually in all categories, tasks usually fall into one of several subcategory types. Like for example, in reverse engineering, you have uh, either something which like an application which you have to reverse engineer to get the flag, right? Uh, which is, for example, checking the flag versus some hash, or it's checking the flag versus an en encrypted version of that flag. Or, so that's one uh, one type, the other type would be you have optimized me's, where you get a challenge and you it outputs the flag, you just run it and it outputs the flag, but it takes like 20 years to do it. So you have to analyze it, understand it, and then reverse engineer it. Well, again, uh, uh, reverse engineer it, understand it, analyze it, and re-implement it in an optimized version, which will just output the flag like that. Um, yeah, and there are like also different types of reverse engineering challenges. So if you if you know that, then you can usually tell like, oh, this task looks like this subtype of a task. And if you know that, then you usually know what to go after. Um, but apart from that, I, I'm not really sure if I can give you any specific hints, because this is like a really high level question, which requires a case specific answer. So if, yeah, if I would get like a specific task, I might be able to give you some hints. Otherwise, yeah, like try different things. That's the only thing I can come up with, which I know doesn't really work as an answer. So I apologize. But that's about it. Well, I can say like ex extremely high level question. Uh, will there be reverse engineering of video clips from Google CTF? Reverse engineering of video clips. Which video clips? Do we have some video clips on Google CTF? I'm not really sure. So I'm not really sure about the question. If you could um, add some additional info to that question, I might be able to answer it. We had, I know we had a promo video which had one flag, but that was the beginner's quest and we already covered it uh, at the end of last week, uh, last, last week's stream where I showed you how to solve all beginner request challenges. How to approach crack, uh, how to approach crack me? Mm, yeah, that's another question, how to approach crack me is basically, so there are a couple of ways. Usually you go for a side channel and you try that, the side channel meaning trying to do a behavioral analysis, like look at the behavior, basically what is the task doing and try to determine something based on that and look on for side channels, for example, is the checking of the flag done character by character? Because if so, you can um, you can basically figure out like, hey, somebody just, uh, like I, I did just put a correct letter and therefore another letter is being checked or I put an incorrect letter and therefore the next letter is not checked. And using, for example, a perf tool or like a debugger or whatever tracer, you can usually do that. So, so that's one way to check stuff. Uh, greetings from Russia. Um, thank you very much, uh, Katatonia67. Um, thank you. Always appreciate donations. Uh, they go to, you know, covering my servers, basically. <laughs> um, but if the site, so the ch site channel is something which is super fast to check. 
but usually smart reverse engineering creators like task creators will do a constant time comparison of a flag and that will just not work so you have to start digging into it and first goal is always to understand what is the flow between um, you entering the password then a message being displayed like it's okay or it's not okay that's usually what you find first like how how do i input stuff and then where is the message which is displayed okay not okay and you can back track from that message to see where is the check and then how is whatever input is processed into that check and yeah that's the default way to do it and again high level answer really case specific you can like a different task different tasks can basically lead into different paths here so yeah that's it you can look for example as, as an example of a side channel approach you can look for um, my last stream when I showed from Beginner's Quest the emoji VM uh, solution. Okay, next question from Noodly. What's your opinion about Libra? Libra would be the Facebook uh, cryptocurrency. I do not have an opinion. I have a printed white paper on my desk which I didn't read yet, so I'm still to make an opinion about it. But it didn't look like a typical cryptocurrency, I think. I just call it like or like market it as a cryptocurrency, it seems. It looked more like PayPal in all honesty. How to approach those crack me? Um, you have to, but that's actually a really good question. You have to get a decent DOS debugger. Usually DOSBox, uh, you can get DOSBox with a debugger. The DOSBox actually has a built-in debugger and uh, it's, I think in the Windows version is compiled, otherwise you have to compile it in. And that's pretty decent, the usability there like is not great, but it's actually pretty decent. You can use, I think, IDA for uh, as a disassembler. And if that doesn't work, you can also try like Turbo Debugger or whatever else. And yeah, if, if you have that, then you just go with default, default reverse engineering techniques. There is, DOS is a pretty specific platform, but the approach is pretty usual. Cool. I guess that would be it for questions. So we can, uh, yeah, we can start with today's topic. So we go to this capture the flag with google.com. We go, go to flagrom and what we see here is, we see this description. This 8051 board has a secure EEPROM installed. It's obvious the flag is stored there, go and get it. So. Again, like what, what I said before is that I think personally that in a good task you should know what to do, but it should be tricky and challenging to do it. And yeah, here I even tell you where the flag is, right? Like just go and get it. And it's going to be technically tricky to actually get it, but there, there are actually multiple ways. One of them unintended, uh, discovered by uh, several teams and Kutschik, obviously, because he's, I think, the hero of today's talk. Anyway, like he's like the third time in a different occasion he shows up, so yeah. Uh, a couple of explanations here for folks who might not know. Um, 8051 is one of the Intel CPUs, which is super easy, it's super simple. It like, uh, I can actually show you 8051 because it's actually blank on my desk. Well, it's in a breadboard, let me pull it out. Okay, so for example, this is an 8051. Yeah, one off. I actually have a pretty large collection of 8051s for some reason. Uh, one of the reasons was creating this task. And yeah, so it's a super simple 8-bit um, CPU, even simpler than AVR, than what you have in Arduinos, uh, than in Atmega. It's pretty funny architecture-wise, but that's not really important here in this task. In this task, the fact that it's 8051 doesn't change too much, doesn't matter too much. It could have been any, anything and it doesn't really influence the task itself. The more important thing here is the secure EEPROM. So EEPROM uh, stands for um, electrically erased read-only, sorry, electrically erased programmable read-only memory, which means it's basically um, like a chip with uh, where you can store data, some data, not a lot of data. In this case, I think it was 256 bytes, so not a lot of data. 
And the way this stuff works is that you can write to it once and then you can read from this data. And this isn't really, in all honesty, an EEPROM. The chip in this task is more like, a, let's say more like Flash, but that doesn't really matter. The thing here is that, uh, yeah, uh, the secure part here is important. The secure means when you write something, then you can say, I'm going to secure access to it and there will be no more access to it. The secure means different things. For example, it might mean you cannot overwrite it, you cannot read from it. It might mean different things depending on the content. On the context, we will get to that later. So yeah, we know there is a board, we know it writes the flag into EEPROM and uh, we know or the, the flag is already written there in, uh, in the EEPROM and we have to read it from there. Now we can connect to this thing, this port, and we can also download something. So let's download something and let's connect to that port. Let's see what's waiting for us. And um, okay, I'm also going to need to create a new directory for this. Okay, here we go. Cool. So um, I'm going to connect first. And it says, what's a printable string less than 64 bytes that starts with flagrom whose MD5 starts with this? Uh, this is a so-called proof of work. It's, um, it's not part of the challenge per se, as in it doesn't really, um, it's, it's not supposed to be challenging. And actually like solving this kind of proof of work is like two lines in Python, maybe three. So it doesn't really matter. It's here to prevent denial of service, basically. That means for you, uh, that means that basically whatever is hidden behind it is pretty CPU intensive. And therefore the organizers want us to use some of our CPU power to prove that uh, we solved something, which takes time. It usually takes like 10 seconds, for example, to solve one challenge like this. And this like, if we connect again, we'll get different values, obviously. And then we, when we solve it, we can run once an attempt to solve this task. Uh, so we cannot brute force it because each time we try to brute force it, we have to run through these calculations, which take again about 10 seconds to solve this proof of work. This is pretty standard. It is there are even libraries for proof of works. So there's that. So yeah, we will not learn too much until we actually solve this proof of work or we read through the whatever we downloaded. Uh, but let's start for the sake of, you know, just getting into it. Let's just solve the proof of work. I'm going to show you how easy, how easy it is. I know that if it doesn't sound easy if you just started CTFing, but there's a trick to it or two, which we can, uh, which we can use. I'm going to use, as always, the pwn base, which is like my framework for solving CTFs. It's super simple. There isn't anything, um, anything interesting here. And as it says, just use pwn tools. I'm using pwn base because it predates pwn tools, and I'm used to it, and I've written it, so I know it. And like most of this is not really interesting today, anyway. Only the networking code I'm going uh, is what I'm going for. Now here we have to connect to this host and perfect. So now if we actually run it, yeah, it just prints it. So now we have to basically parse the message and solve it. Um, so we have to get this. Nothing else is interesting for us apart from this, because this is constant, as we can see, we, we only care about this token. So what we do is we read from the socket until, so like, I don't know, like line, and we read from the socket receive until we get a new line. Different libraries do it in a different way. I can do it right like this here. We get a line and then we can, and I know Usually folks would parse this with a regular expression or whatever. I just use like a, a stupid technique. I'm going to split by this, which means that um, this part of a string is going to item zero in there and this is going to item one. So I can do one and then I can just get rid of the question mark at the end. 
so I can again split by question mark. I do not know that there will be probably a there might be some spaces here. There might be a new line at the end. I don't care about it. I just split by this, and I know that it's in zero. So this is the token, and this is like a poor man's parsing with split. Uh, yeah, I would totally have to do more thinking if I would go for regular expressions. So that's why I'm using these techniques. Let's print the token actually. So we print the token, uh, and the problem is that starts with actually appears two time here. So I have to do for go for two here. Okay, and we get the token. Perfect. Now we have to do the actual proof of work, which we have to import the hash lib because MD5 is implemented in the hash lib. It's also in the MD5, but that's deprecated. And what we have to do is we have to find um, a string, which is less than 64 bytes, which starts with this and MD5 of that starts with this. So um, I know that some folks are tempted to like use a random value here and so on, but usually what's just like totally easiest is for I in X range and the X range is going to be, we have what? One, two, six. We have six hex digits here, six hex digits. That means the range is from zero to F, 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 six Fs, right? And that means the range here is from zero to almost six, well, a little over 16 million. Uh, so like we're in the probability of hitting um, this prefix in while going through 16 million random strings is one. You will always hit it. Well, it's almost one. If you go for 17 million, you're almost guaranteed to hit it. It's kind of random, but that that's should be it. So I'm going to put the X range here. I'm just going to go for one at the beginning because I do not trust what I just said and it doesn't really matter. And I'm not using random values. I'm going to use just integers because it doesn't matter what you put into the proof of, proof of work. Uh, because MD5 is like, uh, from certain perspective, a hash is just like a randomizing function. So this is the seed, then we, could, we go with a hash lib MD5 uh, of flag rom dash. We can actually like store this as is flag rom and dash i with this. Yeah. And uh, hex digest. So if the hex digest starts with token, uh, we, we know we got the token, so we just do break. And now we do s and all uh, s plus a new line, and that should be it. And then we go into this, which will basically output whatever else the server sends. So uh, yeah, and, and that's it. This is the proof of work solver, like three lines in Python, as I said, plus break. I'm not sure if that counts as a, as a new line. And we're just going through integers from zero to whatever, because again, it doesn't matter what kind of input it is. It doesn't have to be random values. It can be consecutive numbers. It doesn't change anything. Um, yeah, and it will just work. So we can use Python. We can use PyPy, I guess, as well. Do I have PyPy here as well? I have PyPy. Uh, PyPy is Python JIT, which speeds up something. I don't have. I, I don't think it speeds up MD5 too much because MD5 is actually being um, implemented in C. That's what I'm going after. Okay, and it says that has. Uh, I yeah, this is totally stupid of me. I don't know. Let's call it. Candidate canned because I've overwritten my socket, which is absolutely stupid. It would work if Python had different rules for uh, local variables, but it doesn't. Yeah, that's what you get from switching between languages. It's a good thing I don't have any semicolons at the ends anyway. Uh, yeah. Um, Okay, now it says that I cannot because I forgot to do this. But as you can see, it actually finds the result pretty quickly. And you can do some lag manipulation here. You can like reconnect every second basically until it finds something. Yeah, so it did find the proof of work. Uh, by disconnect, I mean you can play with lag as in you can connect 10 times, for example. And if in 10 seconds or like two seconds, it doesn't find a solution to any of the challenges, then 
uh, when you disconnect and try again, but it should. It's a matter of probability, basically, how fast you find proof of work. What's the length of your payload? Which means, basically, I we have to send something. I'm going to send, I don't know, one, two, three, and uh, it probably expects some data and it will then um, try to do something with the data. And what does it do with the data? I have no idea, so we will have to analyze it. And to analyze it, I actually have to take a look what files did we download. Yeah, sending the socket is what I did. I just looked at the chat. Cool, but again, proof of work. Nothing scary, super easy. It's not part of a challenge, per se. Mm. Okay, so there's an interesting question I'm going to take it. Uh, Root says, uh, as a manager, I would say that given a, cha a challenge, proper management would be crucial. How is that handled during competitive CTFs? Um, there is not much management because usually it's like this. Uh, CTF has, from a team's perspective, has usually like three phases. In the first phase, everyone just jumps on a challenge which they are most comfortable with and they solve it. Then all the easy challenges are solved. There is no management there from, you know, a captain's perspective, right? And then uh, there are some challenges which are being, some people have are having problems with and they naturally ask for help and other people naturally join. Again, no captain's involvement. And these challenges are solved and then there are only a couple of challenges usually left, which nobody has an idea how to solve. So multiple people together do brainstorming how to attack it and exchange notes. And again, no captain's involvement, everything is pretty organic. And that's it. So from management perspective, if it works like I described, there is nothing to do for the captain. The managing of a CTF team is outside of a competition, actually. Like, you know, day-to-day -day life, basically. Like, what servers we need to get, what domain we have to buy, like, how do we uh, get money to go for some event, do we look for a sponsor, should we get team t-shirts, and so on. So that's where the management part comes in into CTFs. Everything else is like technical work. There's little, little need, thankfully, for, for managing during the CTF. Cool. So finally, I can we can chat about the challenge. Uh, I extracted it already. You can ignore this. This is the file which I'm editing here. Um, so we have a couple of files. We have this firmware 8051, firmware.c, which I would assume is like the source code of this thing. And then we have flagrom, which does no extension, probably a binary, a Linux one. And as CPROM, which is again secure EPROM, SV, which would stand for um, System Verilog. System Verilog being not a programming language, it looks like a programming language, it's not a programming language, it's not being compiled, it's being synthesized, and um, it's actually a hardware descrip description language, which means that whatever is written there is usually translated, and again, my understanding here is so so, is usually translated into gates, like, you know, basically um, connections between logical gates, and that's being, for example, sent into an FPGA, which is being configured in a way to emulate these gates in a way. So yeah, that's basically, if you want to make a, if you want to make a simple CPU or a simple graphic chips or whatever, you write them in Verilog or in system Verilog, and then you put them on an FPGA and, um, yeah, and then it it, it uh, magically works. We might do some Verilog stuff in the future on the streams, but again, it's something I'm still learning. So yeah, uh, you can think about like Verilog being something you write CPUs in. And I guess even like modern processors, which aren't obviously aren't FPGAs, uh, they are still have like some Verilog, which is then being translated into whatever is needed to make a, a real silicon-based CPU. Uh, cool. So we do not have source code for the flagrom, and it's the biggest file, by the way. Uh, we can do file on each of them. Uh, file says the firmware is only data. 
flag ROM is 64 bit x86 dynamically linked, not stripped. We have symbols. That's cool. And we have a system verlog stuff. So let's start by looking at. I don't, I don't know, let's start by running it. Okay, and it shows us the <laughs> this part. So let's start with putting it in IDA. And at the same time, I, I guess I should start using Jidra on the streams, but uh, yeah, that will happen in the future. I'm still going to go with uh, IDA for, for now. And we can look at the, we can open the firmware and we can open the CPROM, the Verilog code. So this is how Verilog looks. Um, yeah, if you know Verilog, I apologize, but uh, but I'm going to make a lot of introductionary comments to Verilog because this is not something common on my live streams. I'm pretty sure I've shown only once Verilog on my live streams. So this is how you define basically the um, well the hardware responsible for the for being a secure EEPROM. We can start by analyzing it and seeing what we can learn about the chip itself. And uh, the, it's basically like this. It's basically a combination of a state machines with some actual um, more or less complicated logic and like bitwise and uh, simple arithmetic operations. Sometimes it also has like some RAM in it and so on. Uh, and uh, important thing you have to learn about Verilog pretty quickly is that if you have, for example, this looks like a function and this looks like a function and this looks like a function and so does this, you have to take into account that all of, all of these always blocks are actually running simultaneously at, at the same time. So it's like super multi-threaded. If you're a programmer, that's how you should think about it. It's like everything is going on at the same time. And if you if you want, you can force it to be synchronized to clock cycles. There are some clock cycles, which is, uh, which are being, uh, you know, like a standard clock. Like we say that our PC, for example, has like two gigahertz or whatever. And so like an FPGA could have a clock, which is like two gigahertz. Usually they have less, usually they have like 50 megahertz and there are, then there are tricks to actually boost it up above that. Uh, the clock is actually usually external to the FPGA anyway. It doesn't matter what is the speed of the clock here, what is the frequency we operate in, because this is an emulated system anyway. It might make uh, a difference if you we would be analyzing a real hardware. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, then we have basically everything in a file is in a module. And the, a module, you can think about a module like basically a chip. And like, that's not fully accurate, but you can think about it like a chip. And a chip has, well, like basically, you know, you see these things here, right? Like the inputs and outputs, the pins. And these are the inputs and outputs of this chip, which would be the clock, like on one pin, you have a clock. Then on one pin you have these things, and what we learn already from here, from these two things, is that you communicate, we communicate with this EEPROM using the I2C or I2C protocol. It's a super simple one-wire protocol, actually two-wire protocol because the clock is on a separate wire, but um, yeah, it's a super simple protocol, we'll get to it later, and um, yeah, so the A8051 is chatting with this Verilog chip with this EEPROM using um, the I2C protocol. And there's actually, uh, oh, sorry. Um, it seems that, I, I said it's one wire for data. It seems it's actually implemented at, as two wires for data. It's simpler in Verilog to do it, it seems. Uh, yeah, there are some complications. Let's, let's just uh, note that there is input and output, which makes this a little bit easier. Then, when the chip actually is starting, this is the initial state of it. And um, here, the logic, just assume that everything here, like all the inputs and all, all the outputs are either 0 or 1, like Boolean values, basically, or actually 1 bit. 1 bit is the proper way to think about it. Um, so these are the possible values. That's not fully true. You're going to have also two other values, which would be like undefined or high, impedia high impedance, but let's not go into the details. It's not important in this case anyway. Then we have, so yeah, the state. Um, the output 
of the communication protocol is set to one to high then there is some mem secure bit which i have no idea where, where is this coming from we'll, oh it's defined here actually so we will take a look at it uh, in a second but it's set to zero then the state of probably the state machine which is um parsing this protocol when it's incoming because again it's not the code here will be a giant state machine or several giant state machines and uh, yeah so I, I don't really know what this is then we have some states of the i2c protocol it can be idle it can start it can load we'll get to the protocol in a second but i don't want to bore you yet oh and here is where it gets more interesting um, as I said, normally, if you wouldn't have this stuff here, it would be a variable would be one bit. But this means basically that the variable is eight bits. Why, why eight? Because it starts with uh, index zero and it ends with index seven. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bits. So that means that I2C control is eight bits, this is four bits, as uh, eight bits, and so on. Uh, the only difference is here that it's actually an array of eight bits. And it's an array of the size of 256. So 256 bytes, which is memory storage. As I said, this ROM has 256 bytes of storage. So this is where data is going to be stored. Uh, then we have wires. Wires, wire is basically just, just a wire, like wire. And you have like this left side here. So this would be a wire connecting this thing and a wire connecting this thing, where this thing is an expression, which is uh, a little bit more funny. This isn't really a division, it's actually like a bit shift by six, but yeah, you can write it either way. So again, this is a wire, a wire, because this is a hardware definition language, so there will be a bunch of gates connected to each other and a bunch of wires connected to each other and a bunch of registers connected to each other. Registers, if you're thinking about assembly registers, perfect. Because that's exactly it. Uh, as like all, all of this here, uh, these are assembly registers. And you can think about them like that. Uh, all the wires are like just wires with some gates on it. So um, yeah, I don't know what kind of gates, but whatever. So if you change something here, it's instantly being propagated here. That's not true for registers because they need to be clock um, uh, cycled usually. Well, it's logic here because it's system verilog. And honestly, I have no idea about system verilog, so I will be making stuff up. I uh, My knowledge is about verilog, which is a little bit different, but it's pretty similar. Yeah, so there's a lot of I2C stuff. Then one thing which was super interesting already is like this, we have this memsecure thingy, which seems to be a four bit, uh, sorry, a four bit register. And um, I don't know what that means yet, but we'll get to that later. And the 64 here is also meaningful, actually. So what else do we have? We have this, which is basically, um, yeah. So what this means here is always when the, um, when the clock is going positive. So the clock is going like this. If you think about the uh, waveform, like up and down, like zero and one, zero and one, right? So post edge means on positive edge, always at positive edge. Positive edge means like when it's low and then it's suddenly going up. This is a positive edge. So when the clock went up and the positive edge was detected, so around here, let's say, um, this code, this block here gets executed. Um, again, do not think about it like a programming language uh, because uh, these two lines might be executed at the same time, but that's fine. And it's just like, assuming these are registers, um, or this, this might not be a register, this might be a wire, it means just assign to this register the value of this. Like, yeah, just one bit register, just a simple transfer, as you can see with an arrow. Uh, enum is like enum, just constants, we can ignore them. Always combinatory logic, it's... Uh, uh, there's combinatorial logic. Yeah, this is the basics of Verilog, and I always confuse them. I think this means uh, do it all the time. Like, all the time. If something changes, immediately propagate the change with almost light speed, right? 
which means that like if this happens, then this register-ish thingy or wire, I mean, it might be a wire, is going to be set to this value uh, and so on. So then we have two more wires, then we have another combinational stuff with some more simple logic. Uh, yeah, it doesn't make too much sense yet to me, but that doesn't matter because we will get to the protocol later on. I'm just exploring, I'm just doing recon right now. Then we have what is a really large state machine, which is doing really weird stuff, but let's just read between the lines here. We have read, for example, here, we have load address, we have control secure, which is quite interesting, it's securing the ROM probably. We have, what else do we have? We have loading an address. Usually when you chat with a ROM or a RAM or whatever, you have to send it the address and then it will send you the data. So yeah, load address means like, I'm sending you the address. If you write something to it, then after a load address, there's usually some data you write to. And um, you don't do it with every operation. Quite commonly you do, you send once, like set the address to zero, for example, and then just keep sending data and an internal register will keep incrementing the address and write to consecutive memory cells. Yeah, so we have some writing, we have some reading. Cool, we'll get to that later. And then, yeah, in the end, if we get a stop, then we go back to the state. Okay, we'll have to dig through this code later on, actually. Cool, so let's look at the firmware. We kind of know that this is an I2C storage of some kind, which has some secure control bits, and that's all we know. Okay, uh, this looks like C, thankfully. So this is a programming language. I have no idea what this SFR is or XData is, so what I can do is I can Google for it. Uh, this is not Google, this is IDA. Here we are. And what we find is we find something called Kale. Let's add this XData here. Yeah, we have some Kale thing and some SDCC thing. Both of these are actually compilers for uh, 8051. And um, they might have a description for us, what is this? And we also like probably know which compiler was used. It was either this, either this Kale thingy or it was this SDCC uh, thingy. And I know for a fact that this one was used, SDCC. And I have already downloaded it. You would have to download it for the, to solve this challenge. So I can basically tell you uh, what this actually is. Let's just skip reading the documentation and uh, cut to the chase. This means basically that this is a special function register. It's a special area of memory on the 8051, where, um, yeah, which is addressed, which means that this global variable is actually placed, has to be placed, or is assumed to be placed when referenced at this address in the special function registers. So if we write something to it or read something from it, we are actually reading from this register, the special function register FFF. Then, yeah, same here, then X data. X data is actually external data because 8051 has, you know, internal memory data, internal program data, internal stack, and the special registers. And also outside of a chip, you could have an external memory and that means that we actually have some external external memory and at this address of external memory, we have the flag. Yes, we found the flag. Uh, well, not the flag, we found where the flag is stored at some point. Then we have two other registers, which is raw access to I2C SCL, but actually might be raw access to pins on the chip. Then we have actually an I2C M, which is I2C master, module chip. It's basically like a controller on the chip which handles the I2C connections, meaning you do not have to write big bit banging code which would implement the I2C protocol. Instead, you write a driver, a really thin small driver to for this controller and, uh, and the controller does all the parsing, all the worrying about I2C. You just, just chat with it and get the data. Um, yeah. So same like, a, you know, when you have a network card in your computer uh, your driver is just handling the network 
um, chipset, it isn't handling like the, the actual wire, right? The wire is handled by the chipset and your driver chats with the chipset. So we have this chipset here and where the control registers of this chipset. So this is, um, this means that we will either have to write some driver for it or the driver is already written. We have the address we want to probably chat with. We have the length. We'll get to I2C later on and some other stuff, including the data we want to send and some state. Then we have two I2C addresses. So each I2C device has an address. The address is 7-bit. Um, there can be 10-bit addresses as well, but forget about them. 7 bits. And after the 7 bits, there's also another bit, which is whether you want to read from the device or write to the device. I think uh, it's, it's written somewhere there, but I think 0 is write and 1 is read. So the, the opposite with, of what you would expect. This is read, this is write. Um, yeah, so you get this address of the device and then you put a 0 or a 1 telling the device I want to write to you or I want to read from you. Uh, so yeah, we have two devices, it seems. We have the actual memory chip and we should chat with the, the device at this address if we want to chat with the chip. And then we have something called secure, which is a different device. Okay, so how does, for example, print work? It just writes the string until we reach the end of a string to the char out special function register. Char out being character out at placed here. So that's pretty simple, we understand it. Then C prom wait until idle. Okay, so yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory. It waits until this global self, uh, sorry, global special function register. It's actually not a special function register, or is it state? No, it is a special function register. The only one of the bunch. The other thing is like external data structure somewhere in memory. It might be memory mapped IO, but Actually, this is already memory map material. Doesn't matter. Then we have, it seems the driver to chat with the EEPROM is already implemented and it uses the, it does use the, uh, the chip, the I2C uh, C master module, which is, I guess, implemented as part of the board. And yeah, this is writing to it. I don't think we care too much. We set the address. We set the length of the data, we send the address and the value, we send the read-write mask to 0 to times write byte, and then we set the state to 1, which means the, the controller, the chip, which is responsible for I2C is actually sending the data. And we, we can do whatever because this looks like asynchronic, but we actually want to wait until it's finished. And reading the data, identical, we just set the read write mask to something else, write byte, then read byte, which would be like, usually it works like this, you send the address to the device, and then you send the address you want to, on the device, in, in the memory of the device from which you want to read from. Um, if you watch my streams about chatting with, on the I2C protocol with the VGA monitors, then we already chatted about I2C, you might remember it from there. But yeah, so you send the address and then you actually get the get the byte from that address. Uh, do not confuse the device address and the on device memory address. Two different things. Like yeah, like device has an onboard RAM, ROM, or whatever. We saw it in the very long description. Then we have oh secure banks. This is interesting. This is a different thing. It seems we set the address to secure and then we set the mask to Oh, the, sorry, the mask is an input. Yeah, the mask is an input and we, we, or the address, so it seems there's like the actual ROM or RAM has one address, but the secure thing has like 16 addresses and we do not send anything there. If we just touch one address, it will automatically secure the uh, the given part of memory, I guess. I'm not really sure what secure means still, but we'll get to that. Uh, if you, again, if you remember my old episode about it, when we were scanning the I2C bus for different device addresses, the scanner actually warned us 
warned us that hey, touching some devices might already trigger an action. And this is, I guess, one of these devices. We just touch it and we already have done something. So a scanner here would really mess with the system. Yeah, then we just tell it to run and we wait for it. We have write the flag. This starts being really interesting. So it says writing flag to secure ROM and then it writes the flag with, to the address, like it writes the byte in the secure EEPROM at address 64 plus uh, zero and growing. And it writes the given, yeah, so it writes the flag on the secure EEPROM at the address starting with 64 bytes. When it verifies that the flag was actually successfully written, it just reads it, same address, and it compares it with what it has in memory. If not, then power off, otherwise it prints done. And then we have the secure banks function, which says securing secure EEPROM flag banks. And it says secure 64 byte bank with the flag. This tells us already a lot of things. First of all, it tells us that uh, we saw the 256 register, 256 byte register, uh, which basically means, means that it's split into four pieces. I told you that 64 would be meaningful. So each of these pieces has actually 64 bytes, which means that, um, and uh, each of these things would be called the bank. So this would be bank zero, this would be bank one, and this would be bank two and bank three. A uh, bank is a pretty standard terminology here. If you're playing with uh, RAM, ROM or whatever, bank is a really standard terminology to, to be called. Actually, like each bank is usually just a, an actual bank of um, like capacitors or wherever is the, the actual memory stored on. Cool. So yeah, and it secures the bank uh, one, how do I, I, I probably should have like, look at it from this perspective, like the bank zero is not being secured, bank one is being secured. So bank one, we secure bank one, and then we try to read the flag again, and if it actually correctly reads the flag, it says verify fail and the power, power is up. So the flag, after securing, the flag cannot be read. That means we can still read or write to here, to this bank, to this bank, or to this bank, but we cannot touch this bank. This bank, we cannot read from it again. I guess the idea here is, uh, we. I guess we, we probably already start having a mental picture of how this device is connected. We know now that we have this secure EEPROM thingy, so this is the uh, secure EEPROM. Then we have the 8051 here. Um, uh, that's 51. And these are connected using the two I2C, uh, I2C uh, wires, right? The one is for the data and the other is for clocking the I2C connection. We also know that this is, probably handled by the master, the I2C-M, which uh, we can use, but there are also these like raw access to it, so we can probably directly bit bang the I2C protocol if needed as well. And probably if this would be a larger system, this EEPROM would have a second port. It's called a second uh, a port basically, where some other device might have another I2C connection to it like separate from our device, which could still read the secure banks. So that means our device just writes the data and like closes its access to the data. It no longer sees the data, but another device from another site can still access the secure data. That might be how this secure EEPROM works, but we absolutely do not care about that our device today. So this is what we have and what we have to work with. We didn't see any Verilog for 51, so I assume it's going to be a software implementation, but Flagrom actually is a software implementation of 8051. Uh, this is probably a software implementation as well, and this is System Verilog implementation, compiled to C and compiled to, to that stuff. Uh, there's actually something called the Verilator, and it's a Verilator, I think. And it's a, something which takes Verilog and compiles it into C. Uh, or C++.
and then you can link it with your project. Really great for testing your designs. It is not a full test, not the greatest, but it works. Sorry. Yeah. And then we remove the flag from the memory. So it seems that even if we would somehow, if we would just, you know, start reading the flag somehow from memory is not going to be in the memory anyway. We have to actually go to get the flag from that security prompt. Then we write a welcome message, uh, writing welcome message. Okay, and the welcome message is what is it? message? Hello there. Okay. And we write it somewhere and it's verified but it's actually written there. And then the main is actually write the flag, secure the banks, remove the flag, write the welcome message there and power off. That's pretty weird, why is it powering off? But okay. So that's fine. This is what we have and now we have IDA. So let's look at IDA, what do we have here? We thankfully have symbols, so yeah, as you can see, there's quite a lot of reverse engineering in this task. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, read proof of work, we already know that, then read user code, which means we, let's look at how it actually looks. It's, what's the length of a payload? We saw this and it runs scan F with uh, this, why is it? Uh, okay, that's pretty weird. Yeah, now it's better. AI. Really, can you just... Well, okay, we, we can see that this is an integer, is waiting for an integer. Hmm. Yeah, so it's waiting for an integer and the integer cannot be larger than 64 kilobytes. Uh, that's okay because 64 kilobytes is usually the, it's the address space of 8051 without bank swapping anyway. So yeah, we can write the whole chip. We probably don't need this amount of memory anyway. anyway. Uh, if we do something wrong, it says, sorry, I don't speak broken, goodbye. Then it reads the user code. So it reads into the user code the amount of data we specified. This is this V3 here. If it fails, it says didn't receive all the declared code, goodbye. It's pretty standard, it just receives our code, so this is like partly... It might be a sandboxing challenge as well, we might consider it, if we would have to exploit the emulator, but it seems we actually have to exploit the secure EEPROM instead of the emulator this time. Then we have read firmware, so it reads this firmware, which we just analyzed a second ago. It reads the flag from flag txt if the flag txt is not there then we have these funky looking numbers let's look at them like this uh, okay er echt no wrestler no it's actually backwards on the real server the flag is load what L loaded here. Okay, on the real server, the flag is loaded here. This is what this message says. Um, so yeah, all okay, right, that's fine. The real server has some flag TXT. We do not have flag TXT. Then it creates a new device I2C. Uh, the CPROM new thingy, I have no idea. And it has this like, oh, and it actually sets the bus to, yeah, so this is like communication, uh, setting up the communication bus, the I2C communication bus with the device. And this is actually like creating the device emulator. Executing firmware, and there is this emulator, 8051 emulator, which I mentioned that were like, I expect 8051 to be emulated. It needs the emulator, it writes the firmware there, it writes the flag there on some memory address. And then it, uh, I don't know what this is. This is probably memory type, like program memory and this is external memory. Might be. Uh, then it's, <laughs> yeah, it removes the flag from memory of the C process, very funny. It might still be in some buffers, but I wouldn't expect it. Sorry. Then it waits until it's executed and then it destroys the chip. 
and then it removes the flag from memory again because removing it once seems not to be yeah, enough. So this is what we already have seen when it's executing user code. This is where we actually jump in when we first gain control of the AT51 code. It, lots, it creates an emulator. It puts our user code in the program memory, I guess. And then it executes up to this number of instructions. So up to 100,000 instructions, which means, which means we cannot really DOS it anyway, which is good. So it executes these instructions and then it removes the device. The de yeah, and that's it. So uh, it seems I was actually mistaken, uh, as in we, I did tell you the design that we have a secure EEPROM here and the AT51 here and they're connected. It seems we have actually two AT51s and the original firmware is running on this AT51 and our code is running on this AT51 and this is actually destroyed, like destroyed as well, turned off, powered off so we can chat with the EEPROM uh, from here. So the EEPROM actually, when we get first to chat with EEPROM, it already has the flag stored in and we already uh, it already is in the initialized and locked state so yeah mm, that's basically it let's try to send some code to it and let's see what happens i did already tell you that i did uh, install as dcc i believe yeah so i have this small uh what is it small device compiler ish it actually supports multiple architectures, but we only call, care about 51, this one. I'm going to check if there are any questions. If there are any questions at any time, you have to ping Shaku, who is today's moderator, uh, to pass me the question, basically. Yeah, so looking at the clock, we are not going to do TPM 2137 today. It will be moved to next week. I apologize for that, but it will still take some time to solve this challenge. And so next week, TPM 2137, and we're focusing on this one today. Uh, yeah, let's just create some code in that case. ASDF.C, because that's the perfect name for the code. And I'm going to steal the declarations here. So I'm going to steal this. What am I going to see? I'm going to steal, oh, I'm going to even steal this. Here we go. Wow, that's pretty large. That's way too large. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, so this is the stolen code, and now I can go here, we can power off at the end, but before we, oops, before we power off, what I would like to do is I would like to print something, so print, hi there, it's me. Yeah. And now let's try to compile it, how do we compile it, uh, sdcc, asdf.c. And it says that no type for specifier const. Okay. How did it compile? I don't know. Here we go. It compiles now. What do we got? We have ASDF assembler, uh, IHEX. IHEX is probably what we are interested in. Uh, IHEX is Intel hex format, and we want to convert this into. Uh, well, into a binary, because I think we have to send the binary. Let's look at the format of, uh, of the firmware 8051 file, which we have. Yeah, it's, it doesn't look like there. Well, it looks totally binary. This is totally binary. It doesn't look compressed in any way. Yeah, it doesn't look compressed. The strings are just visible here. And there are a lot of Fs at the end. And what's the size of the file if we go down? It's... Well, whatever, so it doesn't, it's, it's, it's under 64k, it looks like 32k. So we have to use a binary file as well. We cannot use this ihex file because ihex looks like this. Yeah, and uh, Ida, by the way, can open this, this kind of file without any problem, but whatever. Uh, so we have to convert it into a binary, and I always forget how to do that. Uh, SDCC hex to bin convert yeah that's perfect how do we do that oh object copy perfect i hex binary it's called asdf i hex and the output is asdf bin cool 
thank you whoever replied here that would be i guess uh, dave mcguire thank you yeah it's pretty small but that doesn't seem to matter too much so let's just try to send it to uh, to the other side and see what happens and i'm going to use pound based with again so we solved the challenge now we need to open the binary file you know what i'm going to do here i'm going to do something nasty so please turn your head uh, away because uh, you should not see this system and we are going to compile it yeah we are going to compile it and then we are going to do this yeah so i don't have to run two different scripts this one will just compile it and we get asdf.bin and we want to read the binary as f it doesn't matter in python to anyway but whatever and now we have to read it to asdf okay mm, oh somebody says it's make bin garrett oh hi garrett garrett is the co-author of this task as i mentioned before he did the uh verloc part Cool, so now we have to send it, uh, send all, first we send the size of it, and the size of it is length of ASDF, and then we send the code. It's again pretty standard when it comes to interface, that's how it usually goes on, on CTFs. And that's it. Now we can yeah, run it. Let's see if it works. I expect it to fail. It's still going through the proof of work. Any day now. I could have tested it locally, but in all honesty, I always prefer on CTFs, if possible, to always test something remotely, because that way you never run into a situation where you your exploit works locally, but it, uh, it doesn't work remotely. And so yeah, I know that debugging remotely is harder, but there are a couple of tricks you can use. Uh, come on. Yeah, this is the moment where... Okay, wrong answer, goodbye. I, I guess it like timed out. Or didn't find the, uh, the solution. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay, so it... Let's look here. Executing firmware, it says it displays all the strings which we saw and then executing user code and it displayed our message and this is pretty important to us because it actually tells us that uh, we get output so we do not have to do any weird like time side channels to exfiltrate information we can just actually output it to ourselves that's perfect yeah mm, which means now we have to we kind of know how the system works and now we have to start looking at the Verilog code again to be able to... Well, no, before we do that, let's just try to read the flag. Uh, and there was actually a function written for it somewhere here. Secure banks, remove flag, right flag, yeah, verify. I'm going to just try to read the flag. Let's see if we can actually get something. Ju just read the flag and be done with it. Is it this kind of task? Uh, so I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. I guess I should bring it a little higher. For blah blah blah, no. For I have no idea. Oh, the flag will be. It won't be larger than 64 bytes because that's the bank size, right? Unless we have some end of the flag sticking out, like in the bank number two, but I don't think that's going to happen. So let's do int. Yeah, it probably should be like uh, char or whatever. Do I have? No, let's just do. Let's just go with char. Then i less than sixty four, and we try to read it. And we need some kind of a buffer. Let's get it. The stack on eighty fifty one is actually super small, so I'm going to go with some um, variable somewhere else. 
do we did I copy the definition of a flag variable? I did and it's an external. Yeah, but I'm actually going to reuse it. So read it and put it in the flag of i. Okay, and we ignore errors, whatever. And then I'm just going to print the flag of i. Wait, what does print take? Oh, I'm I'm not going to print it, I'm going to char out it, character out it. So you, you know what, I'm just going to do this. I don't even have to put it in a buffer. I'm just going to send it straight to the device, the output character device. And yeah, let's go again. Any day now. Are there any questions? If you folks have any questions, ping Shaku, uh, then that way, when this is going to calculate proof of work, I will be able to answer some questions. Okay, yeah, I guess we didn't get the flag. Uh, wait, in memory, there was actually this welcome message as well. You might have seen it. It's written here, right? Welcome message, right? And it writes it at address uh, zero. So let's try to read this welcome message. It's hello there, General Kenobi. Perfect. So let's read it from address zero. And let's see if we can actually chat with the EEPROM at all without any problems or are there any issues. Any day now. Still no questions. So. We just have to patiently wait until it calculates the proof of work. We could probably start looking at ways where how we can get the flag. What ideas do we have? We know that this 8051 is different from the 8051 with a firmware run, so there is no chance of it being in our 8051 memory. And even if there would be a chance, we know that firmware actually removes it from memory, like this part of code, right? It removes the flag from memory. We also saw that the flag is removed from the, um, I'm actually going to probably change one thing here, let's just do this, whatever. Anyway, we also know that the flag is removed from several places in the flag ROMs, like the whole binary memory, but, okay, perfect. Yeah, it actually read the message from the EEPROM. So we can communicate with the EEPROM, we just cannot read the flag. Um, is the flag maybe sticking out at the end, of, at the other end? Let's try to read it from the other end. Like, because, you know, if we have like banks and each bank is like, uh, sorry, this is terrible. Like we have banks and each bank is 64 bytes and this bank is secured and we know that the flag was actually written here. Maybe the flag is long and maybe we can get like the end of a flag, uh, of a flag which is actually in bank 2, uh, again bank 0, 1, 2. Uh, then, yeah, let's try to read it. That would be address, uh, what, 128, right? So here, uh, 128 plus i, and let's see if there's anything interesting there. So yeah, we also know that the flag ROM removed the flag from memory in several places. We can probably still find the flag in like on the heap and the buffer of file because it has buffered access probably. We didn't check if buffer wasn't turned off, but yeah. no, there's nothing there. Uh, which means we, we still might be able to find a bug in the 8051 implementation and then exploit it and then uh, just read the flag.txt file because the process obviously has access to it. That's what we can do. Then we can look for problems with marking banks as secure in the secure EEPROM, that's the second idea. Now, this task is in the hardware category, which means it's not a pawn. So therefore, I would assume that the 8051 has no, um, no obvious flaws which we could exploit. So let's look at the secure EEPROM first. And there are actually, I guess, um, multiple ways to, to go about it. I know that advanced folks would actually go for some kind of um, 
proofing like sat solving and so on to be sure that not every like some weird states cannot be reached for example a state where uh, you are reading from a secure bank and sending it to the data for some reason but i am not an advanced folk so all i can do is i can read through this very long code and figure out what's going on now this is the time where I have to explain to you the I2C protocol uh, because there is a lot of I2C code here. So, well, code, a lot of hardware definition of I2C here. So to understand it, you do need to be aware how I2C works. And um, if I remember, it's an open collector uh, bus, but let's just go to Wikipedia. Uh, English one. Yeah, it has a nice logo. It's super popular, like I2C and SPI. Uh, these are super popular everywhere, like literally everywhere. Yeah, look, for example, this is like some EEPROM using this, this bus, so it's not made up. Now, what I want is wireframes, but... Mm, this is the address structure. What I want is like, the, oh yeah, 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 this is exactly what I was looking for. Uh, a waveform, not a wireframe, a waveform. Um, so yeah, we, had, we have two buses, two wires, right? And they are shared wires, but the clock wire is always handled only by the master. There's one master, multiple slave devices, uh, or multi multiple minion devices, if you want to go for, uh, for this more fancy name. Then... Mm, so this is controlled always by the master. Then we have uh, this SDA, which is a shared wire, which is, and both of, of them can be either held by the device to zero, like held to zero, basically pulled down. Or if you, if the device like just does nothing with them and the output is led to be high impedance, high impedance, uh, it would automatically go up because there, there are pull up res resistors to it. So yeah, it's like each device can get down the bus, like this device can get down the bus or this device can get down the bus. And uh, if all devices, both devices let, let it go, the, the bus will just jump to one. So that's like open collector bus design basically in, in short. You just have to remember that you have one wire and the devices can, each of them can control it and put either zeros or ones on it. Now. Each transaction, each packet starts with the so-called start bit. This is the start bit here, which means it's you are holding the clock high. And then while, while the clock is high, you take the data bit down to, to zero, from one to zero. This tells the device, uh, all the devices actually on the bus, hey, I'm, I'm going to transmit. Always, the master always initiates, in, initiates the connection. The devices never initiate the connections. The devices do not chat to the master if the master doesn't explicitly ask the device for anything. Yeah, and then uh, this is, uh, is basically going, sorry. It's basically going to, um, the rest of the stuff is going to be into cycles. First, the, the clock is going to go down, and during when the clock is down, the whichever side is currently sending the data can set the bus to the data bus to either zero or one, depending on whether it wants to send the zero or a one. So it's happening when the clock is down, when the master brings the clock up, and there is time for the other side to read what is the state of um, of the data bus. Is it a zero or a one? So it knows like zero, and it waits. Then the clock goes down again, and whichever device is transmitting is changing from zero to one, or it's not doing anything if it's still a zero or still a one. And then the clock goes up, and the other side can probe the the line, check if it's a zero or a one, and note it down, and so on and so forth until it reaches like. Uh, bit 8 because the packets here are actually sent in 8 bits. For example, as I mentioned, the address of the device, which is always the first packet, uh, or the first byte of data, actually not the first packet, the first byte of data, is um, 
it's a 8 bit, 7 bits of the device address and then 0 or 1 whether you want to write to the device or read from the device. And then yeah, then you send like another bit, uh, another byte of information to the device or you or the device sends something to you depending on whatever, right? Whatever you are actually doing, whatever function in the device you are invoking. And at the end of everything you send the stop condition, stop bit. The stop bit is sent by, as you can see, this like here, you never change anything when the clock is high. Clock is high, you leave everything as is. Clock is low, you can change whatever, you can change the data bus. And on both the start bit and the stop bit, this is actually not true. You hold the clock high and you change in case of a start from high to low, in case of a stop bit from low to high. So um, yeah, but basically implies that here you have to always go to with the last clock going down, you actually always have to go with the SDA to, to low. So you can later do a positive edge and that means end of packet, end of transmission, that's it. And the bus is again free until the master decides to chat with one of the devices again. Uh, yeah, and uh, usually I guess like speaking about like voltage, I think it's usually, it depends on the device. It usually works with 0 and 5 volts or 0 and 3.3 and 3 volts, whatever. But that, that might be really specific. And from what I've heard, different um, manufacturers actually implement details here differently. Now, this is how a, de a default transmission works. Now, if you remember my live stream about again, chatting through with a Raspberry Pi to my VGA monit monitors using the I2C wires, which are in the VGA cable, uh, because the monitor can give you some information, like what's the manufacturer, what's the serial number and so on. I complained that I, uh, one thing I cannot do with the Raspberry Pi controller is I cannot, um, I cannot send the start bit again while I'm already transmitting and I have not sent the stop bit. Why would I want to do something like that? That's actually pretty standard, it turns out. During one transmission, the first thing you always send is the address of the device you want to chat to. But you can change that address by sending again the start bit and then the address of a new device and like some data with that device. And there are some devices out there which require you to start the, initiate the conversation and then chat to like send the address to this device address and then send the data to another device address. All part in, of the one conversation, or of the one, uh, not conversation, but like transmission. And only at the end when you're bored, you are doing the stop bit and that means transmission over. So you can chat with multiple devices during one transmission, but you have to send the start bit each time so all devices on the bus actually know they have to pay attention because the next byte transmitted is going to be the address. And uh, yeah, and I couldn't do it on Raspberry Pi because the default controller, which is on the Broadcom uh, CPU that the Raspberry Pi has, couldn't do it, but you can do implement this protocol using bit banging as well. And uh, yeah, so there's that. This is actually a what is called in the writing business foreshadowing because we will get back to uh, to that later. So this is how the protocol works. And this is, now we can actually interpret all the various states probably here to figure out what was what. Idle is probably when we, ha uh, sorry, when we have the data high and the clock, what was it? Um, yeah, like this initial condition, this condition here. Data high, clock high, neither device is holding the bus down, so it automatically goes up because of the pull-up registers, uh, pull-up resistors, which are usually, usually there. Um, yeah, the pull-up resistor is like a spring, basically. Like, nobody is getting it to ground when it just jumps up. Magic. Um, yeah. Then we have start, which might mean the start bit was detected probably, the start condition was detected. Load control, no idea. Ag when load address. Um, oh yeah, I didn't say about an important thing. Uh, each time you actually get 8 bits, 
then the other side is supposed to send one bit of acknowledgement of or negative acknowledgement if uh, the data was received correctly or if the data was not received. For example, if and that's zero, by the way, if I remember correctly. If the data was received correctly, that's zero. So after you send the address, you are expected one bit selling, uh, telling zero, which means at least one device on the bus, well, hopefully one device on the bus, says, yeah, I'm here, I'm receiving, you can continue. There are some other things like details there, but that's, uh, that's about it. So yeah. Um, so this act here might mean, yes, yeah, send that bit telling that, yeah, I'm listening. And then load address might mean go to the state which actually loads one byte of the address and then the site is this. That's, that's pretty weird. Why is the act here? Oh, oh, I, now I know. It's not the address of the device. If it's acting, that means that it already knows that somebody is trying to speak to this device. It loads the address of in ROM, in the internal memory, the address that the, somebody wants to write to or somebody wants to read from. Yeah, then we have then read, then write. I have no idea if this read or write means read data which is incoming or read the data from the ROM, the internal memory, and send it somewhere else. I have no idea. Load address is, I guess, like this is acting and then going here. The same like read is going to probably go here. Uh, these are, by the way, states of a machine, which uh, if it wasn't clear. Again, in the Verilog, expect a lot of state machines. So yeah, this is probably a state which is going here. Then, yeah, ACK is probably a state which is going to one of these states, depending. NAC is similar. And yeah, and at the end, it would go to, to idle. So what we can look at is we can look at the okay let's uh, let's actually figure out how is the secure bit working we do not have to understand how the i2c communication is working we have to figure out how is the secure bit working if we send what was the address in the firmware um, this is oh yeah we have a firmware here right if we want to secure a bank secure bank what do we do if we secure a bank, we write to the address of secure bank address, and that's actually ordered with this. But what's this address? This address is like, uh, what is it? Four zero. So four zero, or if we shift it by two to get the seven bit address, we actually get two zero. And uh, because we are actually like oring it with one, that means that one will actually jump, uh, not here, here. One will jump here to this. Yeah. That means that this, this device is actually two devices. One device is the securing device and the other is, yeah, the EEPROM. So the securing is this, as I said, four. Yeah. Wow, my binary is so bad today. This is obviously not four. This is four, this is one, this is five. I, I apologize. My binary failed me. Uh, this is five again, too. So let's see where this is this used. Here is like part really deep in the state machine. If the, what's, sorry, what's the state? Case, control prefix, control EEPROM or control secure. Okay, but what's the state? Load control. What's the load control? Idle start. Oh, it's probably the address. So this is a, this is probably a state where we, which we reach after the address is already have been transmitted to us and we have it somewhere or it's still loading. Maybe it's still loading the bits. How is it reading the address? If it's eight, if the control bits, control bits, I'm going to assume this is how many bits have you already received? It's eight. Then go and yeah. Then we go here, which is going to secure the bank. And it's something like control bank. I have no idea what's that we are going to figure out in a second. It's probably, you know, the received bank, but I don't know how it works. And then it just ors with memory secure. So this memory secure is a register, which we saw before. It's a 4-bit register, which would mean 
but each bit is basically just stands for um, sec is this bank secure and if we or a bit there's only or here it's not like XOR is not anything else so we can only secure a bank but we can never unsecure it using this or operation because you know if we have like if this 4-bit register of a memory secure has already 1111 and we send I don't know we even send like 0 here so 1111 or to with 0000 is just 1111 so we cannot using uh, or operation do like unsecure a memory bank now let's look actually at the rest of it because I'm quite interested here else if the state is SCL rising so the clock is rising which means uh, Again, if the clock is down, that means that the device or the, the master, whoever is sending data, can change the, uh, the data bus. But then when the clock is rising and is high, actually, we, we have time to read the data from the device. So we do, this is pretty standard. What this means is basically shift seven, uh, sorry, shift top, f t shift bottom six bits, uh, bottom seven bits by one, and at the end add this bit. It's pretty weird, but this like curly bracket notation is actually like this one here. It's actually the same to I to C control. Again, the control. This is like Python. This means bits between six and zero. Uh, one or uh, I I to C data. Yeah, uh, SDA, sorry. Yeah, this is the, the same, like this and, and this. It's just easier to note it like, like this, more readable, I would say. So it grabs the new bit which just came in and it puts it at the end and then it increments the control bits by one until it reaches eight. When this reaches eight, we go, we know we have eight bits, so we go here and we secure the bank. Now, what is this I2C control bank? This is a wire which is connected to this I2C control register. Yeah, it's a, it's, these are actually like four wires which are connected to the bottom four bits of this I2C control, which is what, is it a register? Yeah, it's a eight bit registers. So yeah, we have a register which is like eight bits, right? And the bottom, um, bottom four bits have additional wires coming out of them and these wires with these additional wires are being called uh, I2C control bank. So it's just um, an alias basically to the bottom bits of that register. That's how you can think about it. Uh, critical damage says congratulations to Dragon Sector for the second place. Uh, thank you. I don't know if you're referring to WCTF or if you're referring to Google CTF qualification round, but Thank you. I didn't play in either, so yeah. <laughs> but I will pass it to the to the team. Okay. Um, so when is there and how is this memory secure used? Or I have a better question. How is this read or write? I don't know. I think it's read. How is this read implemented? So let's go to read this read case. We are suddenly in the state machine inside the read. And what is going on here? We can by the way compile this very log with very latter and we will get these nice debug outputs when we try to chat with it. But we do not that's one way to solve it. We do not have to go over because well because I've made this change. I know this code was actually written by Garrett, but I actually know what the bug is, so we will not have to do any fancy stuff. I will just pinpoint the, the bug in the code. Uh we can do fancy stuff for a different time. Anyway, let's read what's going on here. If data bits is eight and uh, this state is rising, the clock is rising, then set data bits to zero. If the address is secure, if I2C address secure is equal to I2C next address secure, then this is weird. Uh, why isn't it comparing to one, whatever. Then the address is set to address plus one and then ack and then read. Oh, okay. So this is when the data is probably already read. Otherwise, if the security check fails, we go to NAC. If 
the clock is falling. Um, let's look here again. So if the clock is falling and we have actually an ability to change the, the data bus, it should like write one bit to, yeah, if it's falling, then output SDA with output pin, write data there, write one bit there from the memory storage, from the given address, and from this bit, which would be seven minus I2C data bits, like, I guess this is just a bit counter, and that's about it. So the address is selected always by I2C address, and then data bits are, is being incremented by one, which is fine. Cool, now, there are a couple of questions here. Question number one is how does this security check exactly work? And question number two is where does this I2C address come from? So let's try looking for this address. So if we get a stop bit, we know this I2C address is, this isn't the I2C device address, it's the address of the internal ROM memory or memory storage actually, like the index and the memory storage. If we get the stop, which is, I assume, is the stop bit, we get wire stop, okay. We get, no, this is the valid. Uh, I'm just looking for, this is not what I was looking for. Mm, what is this? It's a 8-bit register, okay. Where is it set? Mm, bits. Uh, oh, it's set here. Okay, so in the load address, it actually uses the same technique which I described earlier to read bit by bit. So it bit uh, reads the all the addresses here, and then it just uses it while writing or while reading, I guess. Here and here. Okay, so yeah, it just gets the address from the user. Now, the other question in that case is how does this security check here works? What is the secure address and what is the uh, next address secure? Let's look at that. So this is, both of them are actually wires. They are not registers, they are wires. And what are these wires connected to? One wire is connected to memory secure. So we know this 4-bit register, right? And is looking at the address of, uh, divided by 64, because again, each bank is 64 bytes, which means this 4-bit register has like, if we take the address and we divide the address by 64, which is an equivalent of actually grabbing just like uh, two top bits of the address, we get the bank number and we know if it's secure or if it's, if it's secure or if it's not secure. So it's a wire which is connected to uh, like some gates, which basically get, get us the bit from memsecure register. And the next address is the same thing, but the address is actually incremented by one. And this is already getting to be pretty interesting. So let's go back where we were in a, a second ago. Here. So the security check which works for us is if we are in this state, if data bits is eight and a SEO state is rising, we set this to zero and we do the security check, otherwise we send the data. Okay, so uh, this is done at the end of the data. Why isn't, why isn't it done at the beginning? I don't know, maybe there's another check somewhere else. We'll look for it in a second. Because if the data is already sent, then we can... Now it sets it to zero. So it's really weird because the check is done pretty late, right? We might be able to read just one byte. And after reading this one byte, this check is actually made for, I don't know, the next address probably. Let's look for the, where else is this used? It's also used here when loading the address. So if we load an address and we already have eight bits of address, like full address loaded, 
then if the address is secure, we are setting the address valid to zero. Otherwise, we are setting address valid to one. Okay, so the address secure has to be zero because otherwise we go away. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense because if address secure is one, that means that this bank has been marked as secure. And if so, it means we cannot write to it, we cannot read from it. So that makes sense why this check looks like this. We set the address valid is zero, the address is not valid, and we go to state NAC. We do not allow to read anything or to write anything. Uh, otherwise, is we're going to Agven write, why not read? I don't know why not read, but... Maybe it's, it's like somewhere determined somewhere else in this state, for example, I would take a look. Data bits is zero. So it's reset to zero. The data bits are, is reset to zero here and the address value is set to one. Okay. So that means that it's happening at the end because it's already happened once at the beginning as well. So this is, um, so at the, okay, we, there are two checks in that case. In one check, we are checking if the address which we are setting is already secured. If it's secured, like for example, we would set the address to 64, that would mean, well, I'm sorry, but uh, this bank is already secured, send a NAC and like bail out, go to idle and that's it. Like do not chat with the master. If it's, if we send, for example, 63, then the address would be well, this is bank zero, still bank zero, right? And bank zero doesn't have a secure bit set. So that's fine. The data bits is reset to zero and we start reading this address 63. And once we are done from reading this address 63, what is going to happen is going to like this data bit, res uh, sorry, the data bits is going to be reset to zero. And this check is going to be made. Like is the address secure? the same as the next address, which is secure, right? So it means that um, did, the, did the security level change between the addresses at all? Because 63 we know is zero, and then 64 suddenly is going to be one. So this condition here is not going to be met because we will get zero here, we will get one here. It's not equal, we go to NAC which makes sense. So this is how the protection works. We cannot keep just like set the address on the bank, which we can read. We cannot continue reading uh, byte by byte by byte without resetting the address. Because if we hit the bank boundary, we will actually run into this problem. So yeah, uh, this was not going to, to work. We kind of understand how it works now. Now what I'm curious in is this here, load control, mm, EPROM, no, load address is what I was curious about. If we want to read the byte, right? How do we set the address? How do we even get to this read thing? We do, we go to this state. It says ACK, then transition to read. Okay, so how do we get to this ACK then read transition? We can get to it from load control or we can get to it from read again. Okay. Uh, why? Well, this is pretty weird, by the way, because if we are... It shouldn't ACK, by the way. Or should it? No, it shouldn't act and it shouldn't knock because when it's sending the data to the other side, the other side should knock or act. So this isn't fully I2C compatible, but that doesn't matter in our case. And sorry, the other one was read. So we cannot, it seems that to, say, to set the address where we want to read from, we have to first write to this and write the address and only then we can um, we can read from it. I guess that means why if we look at the firmware code, right, and if we look at this read byte, 
what's going on here is it actually has this write byte and then read byte where write byte is going to be the address so we actually go to the address and then it probably at this point is going to send the start condition again and then it's going to send the address again and then it's going to uh, to read a byte from from it so it's going to send the address with zero here and an address with one here yeah so this is what's the what the master is actually doing it's actually handling this resending the start bit for us again the start bit or the start condition however you want to call it um, now um, there are actually two bugs in this task I'm not going to talk about one. One is an, un an unintended solution, and I, I can tell you about it later on. Now, the intended solution is related to what we have already been looking at, and that is this. It's as I said, like this is going to, this intention here behind this is to see when you are reading and you suddenly hit the boundary between an unsecure bank and a secure bank, right? You hit the boundary and it just says, yeah, like, go away, master, I do not like you anymore because you try to read from the secure bank. Now, um, what would happen if we would read one byte, then send a start condition, secure the bank we are in, we are in like 63, so bank number zero, so we secure bank number zero, send another start condition to continue reading. That means we suddenly have, we jump here, and we are suddenly in um, a situation where the bank which we just read from is now secured. And the next bank is also secured. So we have one one, everything is fine. We go into this check, we go here. And uh, this is right by the way, but the check is the same here. Yeah. So yeah, we, we go into the address and we read the byte from the secure bank. So what will happen after that? Well, we are in a secure bank. We are reading from a secure bank already. Uh, this check will just allow us to continue reading as long as we want. So again, what we do is we, um, first we send a write request to just to set the address. We do not actually do any writing and we set the address to 63. Then we send a start condition and then we send, uh, um, oh no, we actually, sorry, we actually, after sending this, we have to send a read, uh, 60, no, oh, that was bad, let's do it again. We send a write, so we send a start bit, we send a write, and we send the address. The address is going to be 63. Then we send a read, which means we need to send another start condition. We send a read, and we read from... 63. We can totally read from 63. It's bank zero. It's not secure. Then we send another start and we send a secure uh, bank number one. Now the bank is secured, so we send another start condition and we send read again so that we read, continue reading, and we will continue reading from 64 because we didn't reset the address. The address was incremented, so we read from 64 now because our bank is. Um, bank one is actually secured, then we we should be able to read it. Now, how to do it, how to implement it, because that's also a question. And uh, this is actually a pretty funny question because we cannot really, this is where it gets funny, because we cannot use this to do it because it doesn't allow us to reset the address um, and we need to reset the address because we need to, after the first start bit, we will send this device address. And after the second start bit, we will send this device address, like the first start bit, actually. Which means we actually have, uh, we cannot use the controller of the I2C master to do this. We have to implement I2C protocol on, this, on our own. So how do we click quickly implement the I2C protocol? Uh, we go to Wikipedia. And on Wikipedia, if you scroll down a little, there is this wonderful code which you can just copy paste. So let's do that. I'm just going to copy paste this code. And let's try to get it to run. 
Uh, okay, we do not care about you anymore. We care about you. Now this code will obviously not compile because it's totally not... Um, it totally cannot understand our device yet, but we will um, be able to do something about that. I2C delay. Um, it's called a lot of times. What does it do? It just waits. It does nothing. It just waits. Um, let's let's go for a compromise. Let's just do nothing. This device is slow enough, or the EEPROM is fast enough to. We do not have to do any delays actually on the bus. Otherwise, we we could add some delay here. Then, how does it actually? Read SCL, how does that work? What kind of function is this? Oh, we actually have to provide these functions, which is great. So we can provide these two functions. And for us, it's actually pretty easy because we just go with these raw registers here. So we just return them SCL and yeah, so we return SCL here. We return SDL, SDA here, and that's it. Then set. Um, I guess we have to provide these functions as well. So let's provide these functions too. I guess normally, if you would be doing a real microcontroller using a real micro microcontroller on clear. You would just set high impedance because it's, it would automatically. Sorry, on set you would do high impedance. High impedance, but we we are not going to do that here. We are going to. By the way, this is like about the high impedance setting. High impedance when you're going for set. This is something I just recently learned. Before that, I was frying my chips and I didn't even know about it. So um, yeah, and th thanks to Kutschek as usual uh, because I ask him a lot of questions. Cool. Um, set one clear zero SDA. We just write and read from the register. That's it. One clear zero arbitration lost. What happens in arbitration lost? It goes here, here. We don't do anything. Okay, then we have some global started. If started, okay, we can leave it. And this code should compile. Let's see if it compiles. So SDCC. It says error at line 13. What did I do wrong here? Wait, what? Uh, no, it's 76, column 13. 76, column 13. It doesn't like bool? What's wrong with you? Looks fine to me. Type def bool. Uh, Uh, Charbool actually. Okay, define true one, define false zero. Okay, now it compiles perfect. It was just missing like I probably could like include std pool, but whatever doesn't matter at all. So now, since I already implemented I to see big bit banging, if you are by the way on, if you are implementing a protocol in software, it's called bit banging. It's like an official name, you can look it up on Wikipedia. Bit banging. I didn't make it up. Yeah. Well, this one is German, but that doesn't matter. So, now that we have this, we can probably do some... Um, yeah, we are going to totally ignore this code and we are going to probably go for this code. What we need to do, as I explained before, is we need to... First, send the start bit. How do we send the start? Send start. Mm, or maybe we can use this. Send stop. Yeah, we can use this. This is a really nice function, by the way. So what we do is we send... Do we send start? Yes, we send start. True. Do we send stop? We do not send stop until the very end. And then we send the byte. The byte is going to be the right address of the... Of this device. Okay, now the next byte which we send, we do not send the any any uh, start conditions. We do not send the stop condition, and now we set the address to sixty three. 
So the address is now set to 63 and the device expects us to send another byte of data which would be written to bank 0 address 63 but we don't do that instead we suddenly send another start condition and uh, change the address oh by the way the address here is supposed to be ORed with by the way is this an 8-bit address uh, it is an 8-bit address so it's supposed to be ORed with 0 because it's a write and it's supposed to be ORed with 1 because it's a read and now we read one byte. So we do I to see read byte. How does that work? We do not care about that byte though at all. Do we send a knock? No. Do we send stop? No. So false, false. Now we again send the start condition. We do not send the stop condition, and we now chat with a different uh, different device. We send we chat with a secure device. And we, uh, yeah, we just like secure all banks. Every bank is now secured. And then again, we go for reading. Oh, by the way, yeah, this is fine. And then again, we go for reading. So we send the start condition again. We don't send the stop condition. And we do send the, uh, we set the, yeah, the address of the device memory and we set the read flag. And now we continue with reading the flag. And we start outputting it basically. And that's, yeah, we don't send NAC, we don't send the stop bit, we just keep reading it happily. And at the end, we don't even care about like finalizing the device. So let's see if this works. If there are any questions, then, you know, ping Kshaku. And uh, any day now. I'm going to double check if I did any, everything correct. Yeah, this is write, this is read, this is read, this is securing all the banks. We send through here, through here. This is a basically a parameter to this open trans uh, transaction already. Then we read one byte because we need to increment the address. We need to go through the procedure, but we do not care about the byte. It's the byte at this address anyway. And then the internal address counter will increment to 64. And we will be able to, to get through it probably. Mm -hmm. I'm a little... Yeah, no, I was worried about one thing, but no, here we go. We actually were able to access the secured bank, CTF, flag ROM, and on and on. So that's it. This is the intended solution. And again, kudos to Garrett for actually implementing the Verilog code. I would not be able to implement this Verilog code, uh, but it's it's like it's uh, really readable for me, which I really liked. I wouldn't be able to do it in such a readable fashion. My Verilog code looks uh, not good. So yeah, kudos to Garrett. Now about the unintended solution, which was discovered by two people. Um, again, Kutschik, because as, as usual, I, it's like fifth time I mentioned him today and another team as well. It was actually a, a really subtle bug. I think it was in load control. No, it was in load address. If the device would send less than eight bits, so this would never be executed. Um, and then, like the device just, like sorry, the master just sends six bits, for example, and then suddenly sends the start bit. It would mean that it would never get here and this check would never be made, but there would be already some data inside the, uh, inside the address. And I think what you could do is you could actually set this data to be around bank number two. And because this check was never made, then you could just read a byte of information at a time, which is, well, actually you could read any, like all the bytes of information in the secured banks because you start accessing the, the bank from the beginning. There is some more subtlety here because this address va valid isn't really respected and I don't remember but I don't think it's checked anyway it is checked here in load control but that's about it so mm, 
Yeah, and I don't think it's reset unless you stand the stop a bit. So you could set it, yeah, you could set it first to one. And then after you set it to one, you could like, again, go through it. Not like send the start bit, not the stop bit, send the start bit. Only load partial address, like six bits or whatever. And then start bit, read, and you would be able to read from uh, the, uh, well, the, the secure banks because this check would never be run on a partial address. And that's it. That was the unintended solution. Is it easier to find or is it easier to implement than the intended one? No. Um, it's actually like the same thing. You also have to do bit banging to be able to do this. So it's actually because the, the master, sorry, the, uh, the controller, the I2CM, I2, CM, yeah, the I2CM controller would not allow you to send just six bits of address. You would have to actually, or six or seven bits of address, you would actually have to do uh, to do your own bit banging. So the solution is more or less the same, but it is a different bug which is being exploited, which I really like. So congratulations to every team which found this unintended solution. Uh, it was not supposed to be there, but I'm really happy that it was there because it's a cool bug on its own as well. So that's it. Um, yeah, and uh, are there any questions to this task? We will do next week the TPM 2137 from Kutschik, which is another Verilog task from, which is, is totally different. It's also Verilog, but it's totally different from this. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing as well. So we'll do that next week. And yeah, that's it, I think, unless you have questions. If not, then, yeah, I would really encourage you to try this challenge because it's pretty fun. And I tried to make the 8051 emulator to be as good as possible. I actually even ran it side by side testing with some other emulators to make sure that I implemented all instructions correctly. But being said, it doesn't have any interrupts, it doesn't have any timers, so there's that. Mm. Oh, and as I mentioned, the task will be open sourced in soon. Yeah. I think there are no questions actually today. So thank you everyone for being here. I'm going to see you next week. Again, kudos to Garrett for making the very lock part of this challenge and for helping me with this challenge. Uh, that was really, really appreciated and I really enjoyed our collaboration. Thank you to Kshaku for being today as my moderator. And that's it. I'm going to see you, what, um, next week? Then in two weeks we already have two topics selected. So I'm going to leave you with some music. Uh, some music. Happy, hap <laughs> yeah. happy hacking, happy programming. Have a great evening or a great rest of the day. And see you in one week.